Morena Koto, and thanks to all of you who've made an effort to come along and listen today. Um, I actually want to begin uh, by retelling a story that I heard yesterday on my way back from the cocktail party, and I actually think this could serve as one of those great riddles. A woman entered an emergency department, and quite remarkably, she was rapidly seen in quick succession by the house officer, on, house officer on duty, followed by the registrar, and finally, the ED consultant. After a little bit longer, the woman got visited by a medical student. Oh, finally, said the woman. You won't believe how long it's been that I've been waiting to see a doctor. <laughs> so I'll leave you to ponder that, and perhaps afterwards you can tell me the answer. So this is, in many ways, a talk about burnout. But for those of you who are thinking, not another talk about burnout, this is not just another talk about burnout. This presentation actually looks at the far thornier issue and question of what it's like to be a woman in the senior medical workforce. And how, if you are a woman, how your gender matters in subtle yet significant ways. And yet, despite the feeling that burnout has been done to death, um, our research continues to have a huge impact. And we actually really paved the way, I think, for putting it out there as an issue. And I, I want to emphasize again the great, the great publication that we had published, which is still being cited by the likes of Tony Fernando, who was on national radio just last weekend, uh, because it was the first nationwide study to really document the rate of burnout in a complete senior medical workforce. And it's, it was good research, I think. And I think this continued emphasis on burnout continues to be justified. We know why it matters, and there's so many publications out there that I can emphasise as to why it matters for all of you. Um, as Murray has very nicely laid out for me, uh, burnout, of course, also intersects with many of the other issues that affect the health and well-being of the senior medical workforce, such as presenteeism, that pressure to work through illness, intentions to leave, and fatigue management. But this graph, I keep coming back to this graph because this is what prompted the original research. We found that over 70% of women in their 30s who responded to the survey were screening as positive for personal burnout, which is uh, overall burnout. And the key question that we were constantly asked when we took this research around the JCCs, around all the district health boards, is, well, why? What's going on for these women? And we had possible clues in the data from the uh, qualitative comments left, which I think is summed up really nicely in this following excerpt. This woman is referring to the impact of the ridiculous workloads that you all have to deal with, this expectation that that workload can only be done if you take your work home and finish it off in your own time. And this is particularly the case with the administrative work that you have to do. She refers here to her family and childcare commitments, which she means she, she resents that tension between having to take her work home. And she also speaks to some of the, what she calls the old school or senior people, who she feels there's a tension in terms of attitudes towards doing this. So to my mind, the most appropriate way to answer this question of why was actually to get out and talk to women who were in this cohort. And I was privileged enough to speak to 14 amazing, incredibly articulate, incredibly well um, uh, educated women around the country from a range of different specialties. And I just want to publicly thank all those women for making that time available to me. It was not an easy thing to do, to put your head above the parapet and offer to participate in this research. And I thank them for their bravery. Um, but the questions that I asked them was actually more of a life approach to their history. Why did they choose to become a doctor? What are some of the challenges and questions that they've had to face? What are some of the difficult decisions that they've had to make over the course of their history? Do they think their gender has shaped any of these choices? And overall, why do they think women in their cohort face this risk of burnout? So I'm reporting today on the findings from this qualitative survey. It's quite different research to the stuff that I've presented to you in the past. It's not as easy to sum up because I don't have statistics. I know you guys like numbers. But I've tried to package up the qualitative comments with a range of different um, 
academic articles to really triangulate the significance of the comments that they make and justify it in hopefully a robust way. Now many of you may be thinking she's only spoken to 14 women, that's not representative. Well I just want to say that qualitative research has a fundamentally different approach to research than quantitative. It's not about achieving uh, breadth of experience, it's about depth of experience. And the interviews that I had with these women were really long and really in depth. Some of them went for nearly four hours. They were incredibly intense for the women. I suspect for some of them they were cathartic. And for me as well, as a professional woman who also has young children at home, I felt really, really um, emotionally involved with these issues as well. Um, it's almost been a year since I completed the interviews. It's been a slow burner. Um, but I did actually end up taking six months off at the beginning of this year, partly actually because of the issues that I was reflecting on myself after undertaking this research. So there's three key themes that I want to talk about today to kind of anchor the material. Time, role conflict, and gender bias. Now they might seem quite random issues, but as I hopefully will lay out to you, they're all interconnected and imbricated in significant ways. Now, medicine has always had a very peculiar and very particular relationship to time. As I'm sure you all know intimately, uh, it takes an incredibly long time to become a doctor. And throughout your training, you are required and expected to show your dedication and your commitment by working crazy hours at all times of the day. But this relationship between medical, or medical practice and time has come out of a very particular history. And William Osler, um, in many ways, was responsible for the professionalisation of medicine as we know it today. Uh, and he was the first who suggested that his medical students, who were all men at the time, to really become uh, ingrained and familiar with disease and illness, they had to stay in the hospital for 24 hours so that they could follow the disease through its full cycle. And it was he who first came up with the term of resident to apply to his students who had to stay overnight. William Osler as well was very anti the entrance of women into the medical training and medical profession. And it was he who infamously said that there are three categories of humankind, men, women, and women doctors. So this relationship between medicine and time isn't innocent. The long hours and the gruelling schedules of doctors instituted and formalised by the likes of um, Osler and his successors has served to ingrain a particular relationship between medical professionalism and time. And these temporal norms are tightly held and tightly guarded. The strength of these associations is perhaps best demonstrated with the huge outpouring of concern and anxiety around the trend for women doctors to work more part-time hours than their male counterparts. And unfortunately, Karen here, she's an anaesthetist, um, top of her field in America. She is going to be a bit of a subject for some of my criticism today. Because she here is framing part-time work, and she's not alone, but she is framing part-time work as inherently risky. Risky to patients, risky to, to mothers who may want to have children as well, so risky to parenthood, but perhaps most of all, risky to the status of medicine. And she's not alone. There's been huge um, things in the news saying, well, should women be doctors? Um, why having so many women doctors is pr um, problematic for the National Health Service. This is Mary and Thomas. And um, perhaps most recently, the news about that lovely Texan doctor saying that um, the gender pay gap's entirely fair because women don't work as hard. They have competing priorities. So the growing numbers of women entering into medicine has given rise to this whole host of anxieties, more often than not focused around the assumption that because women may on average seek to work uh, more part-time hours than their male counterparts, they're somehow less committed to medicine. Um, and despite their steady numerical growth into medical training, women remain both vertically and horizontally segregated. By vertical segregation, this pertains to the fact that women remain underrepresented in the higher uh, leadership positions. There continues to be a gender pay gap, which we suspect even applies here, despite the fact that we have a mecca. 
And horizontal segregation refers to the fact that women tend to be clustered in particular specialties, especially those that are deemed to be somehow more family friendly. And I'm pretty sure that my reading of the current Medical Council statistics are correct, but it suggests that across all of the surgical specialties in New Zealand, there are only 9.8% women. So that's a great example of that horizontal segregation. Now to bring some of this back to burnout, um, in the context of burnout research, there is a very clear relationship between burnout and time. In the research that I cite there, and also in the study that we did, we found a very clear correlation between increasing number of hours worked in a week and the chance of scoring as positive for burnout. We also found that having an absence of 24 hours um, between your work was strongly correlated with burnout, as was working for longer than 14 consecutive hours. So some of these temporal norms that inhere in medicine are very bad for doctors' health. And for the women involved in my study, many but not all of them um, were working less than full time, um, particularly for those who had young children. Not all the women in my study had children. Um, and what I found particularly interesting and perhaps quite concerning was the sense that they had internalised some of these temporal norms uh, to the point where they were extremely aware as to how their decisions to work differently would be received by their colleagues, and in turn, how they might judge their own performances. I'm sure that they're not just there to make the coffees, but that is how some of them feel. And as the last quote continues, it's silly, isn't it, because you're only getting paid part-time, but it feels like you're pulling less weight. But actually, you're only doing 50% of the job. But it might seem like you're not passionate enough, or it's only a hobby. I don't really think it means that you're not passionate enough, but I wonder if that's how you feel. You feel like you might be judged by the people that don't have children or aren't working part-time because medicine's meant to be a vocation, not a job, isn't it? And the tension for those who had commitments outside of their paid work were summarised by one participant as follows. If you want to be part-time and actually do some mothering stuff, and still be a good doctor, your colleagues will look down at you. They may see that you're dabbling in it rather than actually participating. And this is a recurring theme across the women who I spoke to. Another thing that I found interesting was that for the women who had managed to negotiate parental leave, this was also viewed as inherently risky, particularly in terms of how their colleagues might feel about their time off. Um, the things that I find fascinating in this particular quote was that the woman framed her maternity leave as optional time off. Um, and that, uh, in this instance, her, she had some health issues with her daughter and she wanted to extend that maternity leave by an extra two months and she felt torn in doing that. Are my colleagues gonna think I'm slack? Are they gonna think I'm lazy? And there is research to suggest that the stress involved with seeking maternity leave is not insignificant, and there's been a lot of papers about this. Um, in this particular study in JAMA, which was relatively recently published back in 2017, um, there was a fairly high incidence of what the paper defined as uh, maternal discrimination, and this was strongly associated with higher levels of burnout. And for others in my study, um, parental leave is also viewed as risky in terms of how it might affect their return to work. And this woman spoke about how she felt that after her maternity leave, it was vital for her to come back full time because she felt if she didn't, she might miss out on some of the more interesting or challenging lists that she really enjoyed as part of her work. But here is the gender influence. She said, but a lot of the men in my department work part time too. It's just that they are doing private in their other time, but that's okay, that's legitimate. And for those of you who are on the Women in Medicine Facebook page, there's been some great comments this morning which speak to this very issue. So what I found particularly interesting was the subtle uh, gender politics around working part-time. Um, and this was also framed as also speaking to the visibility. So one woman worked across multiple sites and she felt that her colleagues um, assumed that when she wasn't there in her primary site, that to quote her, she was at home painting her toenails. She didn't view her male colleagues in quite the same way. So to sum up, uh, many in the, of the women in my study referred to these implicit, or rather explicit, temporal norms, which presupposes a norm of full-time work, with the possibility of 
penalties, either professional or personal, for not demonstrating availability. And moreover, as this woman expressed, it's tightly entangled with this idea that medicine is not just a job. A key part of becoming a doctor, of performing the identity of the medical professional, relies upon specific cultural schemas which frame medicine in many ways as mutually exclusive to the competing demands of family or personal time. So this sense of tension between these competing realms is what is often referred to in the literature as role conflict. Um, and there has been, a, again, a huge amount of literature, particularly in the burnout literature, around the um, gender differential in experiencing role conflict and how that is significantly correlated with experiencing burnout. Um, a recent study in JAMA Internal Medicine, again, found that women are far more likely to experience role conflict, this is women doctors, than their male counterparts. And it also explains how role conflict can take many different forms. Uh, it can be the fact that work obligations are impinging negatively upon your family time, or it can be the inverse. And this can also lead to identity conflict as well. In speaking with the research participants about their risk of burnout, many explicitly framed it around the um, difficulties of, of achieving work-life balance or of balancing their different commitments. Um, as this quote continues, now we expect of ourselves to somehow be early childhood educators and household managers and to hold down full-time jobs, but not to drop the ball with any of these things. I think even when you've got really great participating fathers, society will give them a free pass if they need to step down from that dual role at any stage. And whether they actively recognise that or not, I think it's there as a backup for them. So this sense of the, of the two lives being in competition or in conflict was also referred to quite articulately by this woman. This notion of um, the professional being in, at loggerheads with the personal life was framed as not being compatible. And with the attempts at making it compatible, this key source of, the, um, of stress and exhaustion. Um, so again, there's a huge amount of research looking at the different domestic commitments of male and female doctors. Um, the research has found that women are more likely, sorry, men are more likely to miss family activities um, because of work, whereas the inverse holds true for women doctors, and uh, women are far more likely to have that primary responsibility for childcare duties. And these graphs um, demonstrate that quite nicely. This first one shows the average hours per week that men and female doctors spend on household tasks, or childcare, sorry, and this one um, pertains to, it's a recent Canadian study, uh, which found that um, men only have, only 4% of men are usually or almost always responsible for household tasks, as opposed to nearly half of the women surveyed, and uh, nearly 46% of women had scaled back their work commitments for their children. And the gender differences in terms of how domestic situations affect men and women doctors differentially, I think, is best expressed in this graph, which I've pilfered from <coughs> Caprice Greenberg's talk, um, which is also on our website. And it's from a study done by Elmore et al. And it finds that um, emotional exhaustion, which is a key component of burnout, as uh, measured by the Maslach Burnout Inventory, is actually significantly lower for men if they're in a domestic uh, situation where they have a committed partner or if they have children. Having children and being married or in a committed relationship is actually found to be protective for male doctors, whereas the exact inverse applies for the women involved in this study. And this differential between the um, experiences of the lived daily lived experiences of male and female doctors was summed up quite nicely by um, this interviewee who said that um, she's the only woman in her department and all her men, she said, have stay-at-home wives and she says they've got no appreciation of what it's like in my role. Uh, they can walk out the door and turn up to these meetings at 7.30 in the morning, whereas it's a real challenge for me. And again, using this same metaphor of the door, uh, another woman said, well, the men, they have the ability to just walk out that door and go, and the reason they can walk out that door is because she's still inside. Now, again, there was quite a lot of reference to this metaphor of the door, and another uh, one woman who I spoke to 
said that when they went to work, there was a strong sense that any personal issues needed to be kept out the door. And she says, you go into this profession knowing fully what it holds, so the expectation is keep it up. When you come to work, leave out the responsibilities you might have as a mum, as a parent, as a partner. We don't want to know about it. Keep that out the door and then come in. So given this clear sense of some of the tensions and sense of mutual exclusivity and work at home, it wasn't entirely surprising to hear some of these stories of identity conflict and how troubling this can be. And I think how burnout inducing some of this can be. And so this woman speaks um, quite reluctantly in many ways of the sense of resentment that she has for the fact that she chose to have children and of the negative impact that she feels that has had on her clinical practice. Interestingly, when I queried her what she would seek to change, she said it would be great to have one less patient on my list each day so that the workday could finish at 3 p.m. and I'd actually have time to do my paperwork. But what she said is that she would actually like some sort of household fairy who could come in at two o'clock in the morning to tidy her house, to do her dishes, and to prep the meals for the next day. That might give me the chance to sit down and catch up with my reading. And perhaps um, at its most distressing, this conflict can also spill over to make you question how good a job you're doing as a parent as well. And so for this woman, she thought she was a bigger failure as a mum than she was as a doctor. So hopefully it's clear now how there is a strong undercurrent of gender underpinning a lot of these stories that I'm sharing with you today. And so I want to turn now to the, the tricky question of gender bias and what it means. Sorry for the text, but I think it is important to define it. Um, bias are the deeply entrenched habits that we develop through socialisation experiences. And a gender bias is the result of this complex interplay of the cultural and societal expectations. It's all these experiences that we have ingrained in us from a very early age. And for those of you who are interested in this, I would strongly encourage you to read Virginia Vallian's book, One Step Behind. It's an excellent, empirically-based explanation about the significance of gender bias in society today. I think here it's also important to recognise that gender bias clearly intersects with the other isms of discrimination. And here I'm talking about racial discrimination, sexual discrimination, um, class bias, many of these other issues will also intersect. That's not my focus of today, but I think it is another issue which we really need to address. Most commonly, um, you have the sense of a dualistic structuring of characteristics or ideals, some of which are assigned to the male, some of which are assigned to the female. Now, these are problematic. I don't want to reinforce these essentialised notions, but I think it's important to lay them out like this. Um, and as Caprice Greenberg and Virginia Valley and others have really articulately pointed out, it's clear how some of these explicitly gendered stereotype characteristics are deemed to be more important in certain medical specialties than others. And I think here you could probably see a whole load that you might assume to be important in surgery. Now, gender bias matters. If I press the right button. Um, because women can be penalised for either acting in accord with their so-called appropriate gender schema or for not acting in accord with it. Uh, so if they violate these gender norms, if they are assertive, then they get deemed to be bossy. They can also be penalised for simply managing to succeed in occupations which are characteristically defined as male appropriate. And there is... Um, so, uh, yeah, so there's a huge amount of literature on this, and this is a particularly um, interesting study which found that both men and women are equally likely to act in accord with um, gender bias. And so in this particular study, they found that both men and women academics assigned female applicants a lower starting salary um, and deemed them to be less appropriate for the job than the men, despite the fact that the CVs were identical. They actually just did a study where they changed the, the names. So what I think here is that clearly the gender stereotypes that have served to structure medicine are not innocent. For those of you who are brought up in the 50s, you know, if you're a boy, you could one day be Dr. Dan. 
if you're a girl, then you too could be Nurse Nancy. And Julian was telling me last night that when he was in training, they had two changing rooms, one for doctors, one for nurses. <laughs> so I think, um, in many ways, these gender stereotypes, as innocent as they may appear, are not innocent, and they continue to perpetuate and inscribe and circumscribe the unequal career advancement of women in medicine today. And I think it's vital to recognise how in medicine these so-called masculine characteristics continue to serve as the norm against which other traits and behaviours will be assessed. And so to paraphrase Eve Evelyn Fox Keller, who's an excellent um, historian of science, she said, gender norms are the silent organisers of the mental and discursive maps of the social and natural worlds we inhabit and construct. And they remain silent precisely for the reason that the norms associated with masculine culture are taken as universal. Wrap your head around that one. So for the women who I interviewed, it was strikingly obvious as to how they felt their gender was perceived, not only in their collegial interactions, but by patients and by the other medical staff that they interacted with. And in this quote, the woman says, I think there's a lot of pressure to perform. I think women are more unsure of themselves. They feel they maybe have to do a lot of extra work to prove themselves. And I think it comes back to sexism. You know, when you're in ward rounds and you're walking and you're the senior registrar, but there's a tall male medical student with you and the patients will gravitate towards that tall male. And so it's the techniques that people, you have to make to make people aware that you're the leader. And I think as women, we overdo that. We need to overdo that because we have to make up for being female. And so this need to make up for being female also transmuted into certain ideals around comportment, behaviour and dress. And so as this woman said, you're supposed to dress a certain way, you're supposed to act a certain way, and you're supposed to be, as a female, unapproachable, grumpy and bitchy. But if you're forceful and proactive, then you are deemed to be a bit of a bitch. But if you sit back and you're docile and feminine, then you get walked over and you don't win either way. So overwhelmingly, when I went through the transcripts, many of the women spoke of having to navigate this invisible line of expectations, of not being too aggressive, of trying to be assertive, and not trying to be too uppity. And this felt, uh, they described as being one of the hardest things that they had to navigate in their everyday interactions. Now to come back to Karen, she wrote this piece uh, back in the January of this year about how to avoid a Me Too moment in medicine. And her advice for women out there was to um, adopt a professional appearance. If you're very pretty, then it's even more important that you have a severe hairstyle if you want to be taken seriously. Now, can you imagine how it would be if this advice was given to a male colleague? John, if you want to be taken seriously, you need to shave off that beard. <laughs> it, just, it just doesn't happen. There's a very different set of rules. And so... Um, one of the women who I spoke with said that in response to this, um, she was very aware of um, the pressures, and she relayed to me a story of a, a female surgeon friend of hers who commented that at the beginning of the day, it's, it's really easy to line up all the female doctors and tell which specialty they'd come from. The physicians always look well-groomed and rested, but the surgeons look like they've been dragged through a bush backwards. They try and put you through hell to try and weed you out and make you into a man. And she said, you know, she went from brushing her hair to shaving it off, so she didn't have to deal with this. And many of the women who I spoke with felt that their gender was received quite differently to their male colleagues in their professional encounters. So, for example, in this interaction with a, um, a junior doctor, uh, the woman said she was told, can you please start acting like a consultant? And she's like, what do you mean? I'm not going to bark order at you, at you. I'm actually here to try and educate you in a different way. And all the women who I spoke to, in various degrees of annoyance, spoke of their uh, constant misidentification as a nurse. And again, most of them laugh about it. Oh, you know, it's just one of those things you've got to put up with. But actually, it's not innocent. And as this woman says, it does great after a while. And there's nothing wrong with being a nurse. But it's this assumption that because you're a female, you're a nurse. And research suggests that um, female consultants are more likely to experience lack of cooperation from their nursing staff than their male colleagues. 
And for this woman, she said that her nurses definitely said stuff to her that she didn't think they would ever say to her male colleagues. Um, things questioning her judgment. Have you finished yet? Do you think you've finished yet? Don't you think you should close up now? You've been doing this for quite a long time. And there is considerable research to suggest um, that traditional stereotypes as to what a doctor is supposed to look like regularly leads to this misidentification. And also this need to, to change your comportment if you want to be recognised. And this is a quote from a woman who was telling me how for three years in a row, her nursing colleagues had rolled out her preference tray with the incorrect equipment that she needed to conduct her surgeries. And she had up until that point said very politely, can you please get what's correct on my preference card? Come on guys, it's not what I need. And then in the end she just lost it and she slammed her fist down and she demanded to see the charge nurse and she swore at her. She acted like a surgeon. And it was at that point when they turned around and started getting things right for her. So there are some obvious, still explicit instances of sexism in the medical workforce, like this shocking situation in Japan recently. But as Van Badham, it's not just restricted to Japan. And I think that the consequences, subtle or perhaps not so subtle, are best demonstrated in the words of the woman who I spoke to. And I just want to end with a few more quotes. I think for me, the risk of burnout is amplifying at this point of my career because I have tried so hard to show my dedication. But the more you do, the more stress you place yourself under. But if you don't, you seem to be less than the male doctor who's doing the same. And this woman at this particular point said, I've been running at 150% and I'm having to lean out now for my self-preservation because if I don't, I know I'm going to hit burnout. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, my male colleagues are continuing to accelerate up. They're getting the leadership positions. They can apply for the clinical directorships, all those things. And so I'm being left behind. And this woman, if you're not alpha mailing it up every day, and telling everybody what an awesome surgeon you are. I feel that my work is disregarded. I don't feel appreciated, and that's why it's, I feel there's such a disconnect, and it's such an unpleasant place to be. And society's expectation is that you will always be perfect and always professional, and yet you have to be empathetic and compassionate and connect with your patients, but not enough to cross that line. So you're always trying to be perfect and you're always trying to keep your home life perfect as well, whether or you've got children or not. And so to return to this question that this whole research actually set out to answer, why is it that um, this group of women have burnout? Well, we know that it's a fatigue phenomenon. We know that it is a response to chronic job stress. And at first glance, when I started this research, I thought, oh, well, it's obvious. These women are at that point where they're consolidating their decade of doom or the decade of darkness of their medical training, they're consultants, they're, the buck stops with them. And they're also at that point in their life where they are facing certain biological realities. Do they want to have children or not? It's the time when you really have to start making those decisions. It is an incredibly stressful time. But I think the obvious answer to this question actually reveals the real truth of why it is that women in this cohort are experiencing burnout. And this was a great revelation that my wonderful um, colleague Angela Balich came up with. I think um, women are experiencing burnout not because they're trying to do too much, but because their success continues to be judged alongside outdated notions of professionalism, of competence, prestige and toughness. They're burnt out because their abilities, their interests and their standards of comportment continue to be assessed in light of essentialist notions as to how women should behave. And finally, the women in this cohort may experience burnout because medicine, I argue, continues to be a form of work based on ideals of an unencumbered worker. Somebody who is able to immerse themselves in their medicine, in their job, at the expense of all else, perhaps even at the expense of being able to look after themselves. And without recognition and validation of these underlying causes, we are left with stereotypes to explain why women as a group have these higher rates of burnout than their male counterparts. If they can't, if they get burnt out, 
It's because they're not tough enough. It's because they're just weaklings who whine. Perhaps they have these competing priorities. They're juggling too much. But these messages tell women who can succeed that they are the exceptions and that women who have the burnout or have their setbacks in their career, that it's their own fault for failing to be success, uh, sufficiently aggressive or successful or committed to the job. And so I actually want to draw upon um, the words of this columnist from the New York Times, Lisa Belkin, to suggest a solution to this. And as she said, it's not that workers, both men and women, are demanding too much, but it's that the profession is archaically structured. And the answer is not to shut up or buck up. It's to recalibrate the hours and expectations so that they can be done by the new worker, not a man with a wife at home, but rather a mother or a father with a working partner and responsibilities at home. I think it's also important to remember that it's not just women who are seeking these changes, there are many young men who are seeking these changes too. And that new generation of doctors coming through in many ways, I think are raising these issues quite rightly. Men are seeking different ways of working too. They want to have some dedicated time with their families and to come home for dinner some nights of the week. Why does this mean that they're not committed to their patients? Why can't it be interpreted that this next generation of doctors coming through value balance and, in fact, may make for better doctors as a consequence? The, the research suggests it. And for the district health boards around the country, we know we have this massive staffing shortfall. We know we have these huge, ridiculous workloads that are just becoming harder and harder to do. So if we're serious about making our district health boards the employers of choice in the future, we know we've got some serious work to do. We know we need better resourcing, we need better staffing, and we need more manageable workloads. But we have to couple this with a fundamental shift in values and expectations. We have to challenge our expectations around what it means to be successful and dedicated. And traditional expectations as to who is best equipped to practice in a different specialty may also need to be revised. Medical students should not feel pressure, either directly or indirectly, to enter into specialties because of social expectations about the professional strengths and weaknesses of men and women. And for those of you in the audience, perhaps those with um, the men, this isn't me as it meant as a threat. This focus on gender is actually meant to be an opportunity. It's meant to start these difficult conversations. And this is the point in time where we can choose if we want to make a difference or not. According to the recent data, there are 55% of six-year medical students coming out of New Zealand universities who are currently women. This is a time when we can choose to make a difference or not and not say, oh, God. <laughs> Improving gender equity is actually essential for the future of our health system. And true gender equity will pay dividends for our parlour statistics of burnout, of presenteeism. And I think it will also ensure fairness and justice for both men and women who choose to be doctors. So finally, I think this is the challenge, ensuring our district health boards become the employers of choice in the future and that we have a health workforce who are able to respond to the challenges of the future health needs. I think it depends on it. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Charlie. Very stimulating talk. We've got um, five minutes for questions. Do you want to do that? Any questions or comments? I'm a doctor, I can't turn the microphone on. <laughs> I just want to say what an amazing presentation that was and a um, couple of thoughts. Firstly, the ASMS is really lucky to have you. Like, you're a fabulous researcher. <laughs> And you've really tackled some big issues for the broader medical profession over the past few years. So I just want to really total your effort for the ASMS and for, you know, the broader um, senior doctors um, profession. 
I was just really uh, interested in a couple of thoughts about um, what you're saying. So firstly, you know, so 55% of med students are women. So I just want to uh, draw attention to the fact, though, that actually 90% of the health sector workforce are women, that actually the health system is run by women, so that these issues, they are absolutely fundamental to women doctors, but they're actually fundamental to the health of our health system and to how we treat our patients. So um, these, these issues, we should think about other professions as well. The other question that I had, and I was interested as to what you thought about this, is that obviously as the number of doctors who are women have increased over time, um, I wondered if you looked at who those doctors were creating relationships with. For example, if when it was predominantly male, they weren't marrying women doctors, and now that the medical classes are um, more even in their gender, I'm wondering if they if there is a sort of a double jeopardy impact for example, on burnout, because uh, is it that women doctors, so doctors are now more likely to be marrying each other? Did you think, did you look at that? Yeah, it was interesting in my study because some of the women who I interviewed were in doctor-doctor uh, -doctor relationships, um, and looking at how they manage their commitments was quite interesting, but not all of them were. And even in um, situations where their husbands uh, were in jobs where there was obviously a wage discrepancy. As a female doctor, they were earning more money. There was still that um, kind of expectation that it wouldn't be the man who would shift his work. It would be them, partly because they actually wanted to be the primary caregiver. Um, so I think there are some interesting issues around that. Uh, there's certainly a literature which talks about um, where women doctors primarily get their sense of support from when they're at work, which is quite fascinating. And interestingly, in professions where there are very few women, um, for example, in surgery, some of the researchers suggest that they actually get that sense of support and collegiality from their other female colleagues who aren't necessarily the doctors, so from their nursing staff um, and so forth. So um, gender matters in different ways, and it can also shape the types of social support networks that you form in your workplace in quite different ways too. So it's certainly a really relevant issue. Thanks. I'm just going to hand over the chair actually to Charlie and to Sarah for this next panel uh, discussion, what is needed for change for women in medicine. Yeah. But before I do that, I've got one question for you, Charlie. So, um, Chief privileges, Murray. Yeah. Uh, so gender bias, I mean, it's, it seems like one of those things that's very ingrained, it's probably um, thousands of years for, uh, possibly. There must be some aspects of it that are probably uh, useful or protective or, or help in our, in our relationships. It obviously applies equally to women and, and to men. Yep. Um, and the, the bias that you're talking about against women is coming from women as well as men. Yes. Yep. So can you, what are the, what are the ways around this? What's sure. the solution to this? I have, I don't know if Charlene, if it's gonna come up, because I had a, a couple of hidden slides. So will it come up or not? I always have a few slides up my sleeve, but there is this great um, table. Don't worry if it doesn't come up. But it talks about, um, and Caprice Greenberg talks about this in her talk as well. She says, the first step to overcoming gender bias is actually to accept the fact that we all have it. We're all going to have a, a layer of gender bias in our professional interactions and our expectations. And so I think the first step is do a test like the Harvard gender bias test, the implicit bias test. Become aware as to how your level of gender bias um, may inflect your interactions with people or your expectations. That is the first step, is acknowledging and accepting that we all have gender bias. Even Angela Balich, <laughs> who's one of the staunchest feminists I know, she also has a bit of gender bias. <laughs> so start out by becoming aware of it, and once you've got that awareness, then you can progress through. And there's a really great table, which I did have hidden away somewhere, don't worry if we can't find it, but it's in Caprice's talk, which talks about the steps to overcome gender bias. And there's also a great paper where they did a systematic intervention in an academic department to try and overcome gender bias, and that's a really good paper to read. Yep, thank you. Mm -hmm.